Similarly, we could think of things like how fast are we to resolve bugs? Like if, if bugs are there on the live site for a long time, that's a problem. And even like your ability to follow procedures as a, as a developer. So if you are able to follow the procedures set up, probably you will improve faster. How many of you know the word developer productivity? Productivity. So, not that recent, but a report of 2013 developer productivity from, from that group uh, says that most of the companies don't really spend time to decrease their technical debt. So technical debt basically means, for now, let's, let's do it like this, we will probably solve it later. Probably. Uh, for now, let's not adopt any um, auto automated uh, things. Let's just go like this. Later we might look look into it. For now, let's not follow coding standards. Nothing. Let's make it work. Performance. We'll see what happens. So those things add up technical debt to what you do. And as for the developer productivity report, almost half of the people only sometimes work to reduce this technical debt. So from here we should learn that refactoring performance and those things also count. Then the other thing is what would what what would it take to be better from a behavior point of view? So trying to improve and the will to improve doesn't is not like a one time job. You do it today, done. It's not like that. It comes with a lot of patience and persistence. You you will really need some patience and need to practice what you're doing so that you become better. Okay. With this context, think of three things that you think would improve by appeal. Everyone, just, just think of it. And uh, tell me your number one list. Just uh, raise, your, raise your hand whoever wants to tell me one thing that you think will improve by appeal technically. You thought of, you, you thought of three things, man. Just come up with the first one in your list. 
Development process. Sorry? Development process. What do you mean by that? So by that you mean a, a flow? Yeah. That, that, that things should be in a flow in, a, in some order yeah. uh, and the things that you do should be divided into proper chunks. Okay. Those, are, those are called tickets and, and issues. So you mean you, you need to have a flow. Someone else? <coughs> go ahead. Uh, QA. Very Okay, that's a, a thing I would agree with. But QA, by QA, what do you mean? Do do you want it to it to be fully manual or or somehow automated? No, it could be like manual or automated. So maybe if it's even automated, even better. better. Okay, someone else. Planning. Planning, a very vague term again. What do you mean by that? Before starting any project. Uh, just going uh, before going to the coding or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to plan everything out. Like <clears throat> we should be clear what we are doing, and you know, uh, of course there comes the timeline. Timeline also there. Mm -hmm. So we are we are going to do this mm -hmm. at this time. So that's our part. By that, do you mean we need to follow uh, waterfall or? Like how, how we are doing, kind of agile. Will it will it fit with that, or do you think we will we we will need to follow something like a straight waterfall? No, I don't have any idea. About that. <laughs> <laughs> so waterfall basically is we, we just have everything pre-set up even before starting. So specifications, design, code, test, deploy. As it is waterfall, it just comes down, it never goes up. Agile. If you go agile, it will the same process might happen every week. So then you have things to revise, and you have to you have things to make better. So, so that then, mean, yeah, go ahead. Um, when we are doing in Azai, mm -hmm. so when we are working as that, mm -hmm. uh, so planning doesn't come. Planning comes. The thing is, documentation is not that that much of a priority. That's basically Azai. I could go on on Azai, but that will come later. But for me, from from when I was working here, like five years back. And what what it's now, what I what I can see or, or what, what I can think of is not much has changed a lot in terms of how we deal with things technically. As Anjusta also pointed out, we still have areas to go. So, in my point of view, these things would really help why I feel improve technically. Uh, developer productivity, I already talked about it. Like basically, developer productivity would mean. You are able to uh, churn out or get the most working code in the least time. That's the simplest uh, developer productivity definition I can give you. Something that we talked about that, that came from the back was planning. I mean, issue planning, that is the issue flow. So we would need like a good issue flow, which, says, which would say where the project is right now. We could even have reporting tools that from just one glance or from this one screen, we, we would know where the, where the project stands as in now. Um, <coughs> something else that, that didn't really come out were standards. How much do we follow? How many of you are only do PHP or mostly do PHP? I do five, six, at least six of them. So how many of you, of you know what is PSR? What does that mean? We have to. We have to write the, the writing this writing a function. We have to write a doc log. Then you know, we like to the coding standards, the the indentation, and the stuff. So okay, fine. That, that that is PSR two or PSR zero. I don't know much. <laughs> <laughs> PSR zero. I think. Sorry, PSR zero is the auto reading standard. What you are talking about is the code formatting. That's PSR two. So being a PHP developer coming at two thousand fourteen should be knowing what PSR is. And then things like these probably should have come from you guys going to on this slide saying, <coughs> we need to follow this. This is going to help us. This is going to help our productivity as well as make us better programmers. So things like that. OK, uh, how many of you have heard of Docker? Especially the sys, sys admins, please. Good. Uh, you think like to manage the multiple servers? Okay. Docker to manage multiple servers. 
know, like uh, for working with the different servers, multiple servers. So we can provide uh, update, mm -hmm. like regarding ports and multiple access. Is it like that, or is it about containerizing stuff? Interesting and developing distributed systems and so on. Why don't I hear the word container anymore? Because it's about containers. So what you are saying can be done with Vagrant. How is it different from Vagrant? Uh, different uh, running environment. We package everything we do into a container. Nice. Has anyone of you come up with this idea or tried to apply Docker in any of the applications? I have used it, but not so. Not, not its idea, you mean. So you have to personally try to figure out stuff. But anyways, uh, how many of you know about code reviews? Okay, what's, going on? what's a code review? Well, after you're done writing, you review your code. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, does that mean, have you heard of, uh, what is it called, Robert, Robert Duck debugging? Mm -hmm. Or you can say, well, what you just said could even be rubber, rubber Duck debugging. What, does, what that means is, you place a Rubber Duck here, a, 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 a yellow Rubber Duck, and you read your code to that Duck. <coughs> but that's generally not a code review. Code review would mean you would complete your task, uh, and then show it to someone else, basically a team lead or someone. Mm -hmm. To facilitate that, the one that we use GitLab has merge requests, and GitHub calls it pull requests. So that's where all your changes are there in one page. Someone else could be your lead, could be your subordinate uh, developer. You both together, or maybe he just checks through the code. If you find something like PSR standards are, are, are not right, or Probably the code is too too difficult to understand, too complex. You would comment on that, and then you would change your code. So these are scattered stuff. Let me channel them into some some form. So first thing, I think that also came from the back is process management. We have been trying to do this since a long time, but what we we need is an issue flow. If you if you are already logged into this. URL with this username and password. Uh, you could go to this slide and then click to that link. All the blue, blue stuff is our links. I have created a document, so you could uh, check that. Basically, what that would mean is to follow something which is based on Kanban or Scrum. Both come out kind of uh, are kind of agile procedures. Or you could click the other link and read more about it. So basically what I would say is we would have around seven or eight columns. Initially, there would be something like, so there is a big backlog, and there is a doing column, and there is a done column. These are the main three things. So week backlog will have things in priority. So Kanban, which started in Toyota around 1930s, 40s, I forgot, Japan. So they have Kanban is just a visual board. So for us, the main columns there are three. The week backlog, which has to be generally completed in this week, the, the, the doing column and the done column. For, for us, the done column would be, okay, let's review the code. So as in the doing column, you would have tickets in the priority list. So the, the highest priority, as in now, will be on the topmost place. So anyone who is free will generally pick the first or the, or the second ticket from, from that column. Uh, if I could log in, I would, I would show you show you how, how it looks, but let me do it later. And then the, the simple formula here is one person can do one thing at, at a time. So whenever someone is free, someone would pick the first or the second ticket, put it into doing. Generally, if you flow, if you follow a git flow, you would create a branch from a given naming convention and start your work. After you're done, you would open a pull request, you would put that pull request in the tickets comment, and then pull it to pull request for done. So that's basically the issue flow. I think that would help us. Another thing is Git flow. So how many of you use Git? Almost everyone, right? How many of you push in master or develop, whatever the branch here is? Almost everyone. That's a problem. So <laughs> just take the best practices that I listed here. 
probably you, you also need to check the links. But I, to simplify it, what, what I would say is these two <coughs> things are related. And the thing here is we should have a branch naming convention and a culture to review code. So basically, if I do something of, let's say, a stream, and the project to code is AS, I'm just giving you a very rough example. So then my, my, my project ID in Redmine would be 106. Every, everything there on Redmine has an ID, as far as I remember, yes. So if I'm starting a ticket AS106, I would go to master branch of HStream, create a new branch out of that, start working. Let's say I added a form, I add one table in the database, I added all the things, then my, I, I tested my stuff on my local machine. Then what I would do is I would create a pull request a merge request in GitLab. So someone else, maybe my team lead, maybe the, my, my support who who's working on, on the same project, will just give it a look. Probably he'll take like three minutes to say some stuff. Uh, is, the, is, is the coding standard right? Uh, do I get the variable names correctly? Is it uh, complicated? Is it too complicated to be understood by someone else? So those things will be just there. You, you get some <coughs> comments about the pull request. When everything is fine, it will get merged to the perpetual branches. So develop, master, and release are called perpetual branches. In terms of Git flow, uh, we could even follow a simplified one or a full one. For the full one, it would be three perpetual branches. These are not for any feature or a, or a bug fix. So develop, master, and release. Develop would mean anything that is currently being worked on. OK, so if, if someone sends a pull request, generally it will go into be merged into develop. Release would be something that's on staging right now. So that's a release candidate, RC. If everything is fine, QA thing. If everything is fine, if, if, if everything is tested correctly on the staging, potentially this can go live. So that's why develop is another copy of the release, which the, the things that need to be released. If everything is fine, we tag out of release and always deploy a tag. So as far, how many of you do uh, git tag command? Probably you guys are using GitHub. Okay, so it would be a very good idea to have a Git tag for every live release. So every live release will be a tag release. That's the full Git flow. For a simplified Git flow, what we could do is we just have master. <coughs> if I start working on something, take a branch out of master, send a PR to master, and every ticket is deployed live one one at a time. So only one 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 ticket at a time. That's why these two things are quite interrelated. Mm, if you click the Git flow link, I have another slides about the simplified one, but we are having discussions, I am in this side, about putting the full one, but the reading of that won't hurt anyone. So after process management, I think the other thing we need to focus on is software quality. Software quality not only in terms of does the software have, have bug, has bugs? Uh, when I deploy live, do I have to roll back and, and things like that? It would start from code quality tools itself. Okay, the guys who know PSR, do you know that there is a coding standard fixer? Okay, so there is a coding standard fixer which fixes your code if it's not in PSR. It just released, they just released uh, 1.0. So we need to, step forward towards these tools. <coughs> All of them are links. This is much much on the on the much in focus with PHP. So if you are doing Python, probably there are tools that I don't know of, but there should be tools which will give you a proper standard of coding. And afterwards, after we are at the at a given level, we could even go on to using service like Codacy. Codacy would change uh, check all your coding standards and even give you suggestions about variable names and stuff like that. All the, all the services I would talk are free. So it would be even better for the, for the management. Next thing we should focus, now this would talk something about uh, real QA stuff, is automated testing. So for PHP, we have a PHP unit, which is generally used for unit testing, but can also be used for functional testing. How many of you know the difference between functional and or integration and unit testing? Let's say functional and unit testing. So basically, if you test code 
in isolation, just that class, just that function, that's unit test. If you combine stuff, if you if you test if if whatever I provide is saved to the to the database from the form to the model to the database, that's an integration test because you are testing parts of it. So functional and functional functional and integration testing are quite similar but, but not the same. But if you if your test involves multiple multiple classes, multiple entities, generally it's integration testing. If your test is targeted on seeing that this unit of code is working fine or not, that's unit testing. So mocking is a very widely used concept in unit testing. <coughs> I think you can read it on your own. For reference, for, for the PHP developers, you can look into that open source project called Jump, and that has like a good starting point of how they write tests. That uh, that project is a is a project management software with two modules complete, and I like the the, the way that he writes tests for it. And yes, we should also look into real functional testing. If it's PHP, I would recommend Behat. So Behat and me would generally can even like pop up the browser and start clicking randomly here and there, fill up the forms, but everything automatically. You just write code and the code transforms into actions onto the browser. So this could be another step that we could take. Yeah. Another very important thing that, that would come after integration, after we have tests, is continuous integration. So continuous integration would basically mean, are all my tests passing? Yes. Then can I deploy this code? Yes. Let's go ahead and let's deploy. If the, if the deployment process is fully automated, that's somehow termed as continuous delivery. But continuous integration is, as I said, master, the other branch, I did some changes. Let's say I have 200 tests. I added three more. So now I have 203 tests. I push the branch, do all the 203 tests pass. If everything is green, it's fine. So continuous integration, we could use, for that we could use GitLab CI, as we already are using GitLab, or we could use Shippable, which is uh, free for one one container and around twelve dollars for a year. So that's that's also a good deal. The other thing we need to focus still on the software quality. How many of you know about Neural? One, two. How many of you have used uh, Relog or or Logstash? Fine. So. We need a way to monitor whatever is live. For how long has been a stream running? Okay. For how long has been D groups or what 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 was that? D portals. Eight A stream. IATI is other one. A stream. Two years. Okay. In two years, how many times did we deploy live? <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. So we don't have a count. In in two years, how many times did the site go down? <laughs> for how long? We, we, we don't account for it. In two years, uh, what was the average error rate for that, uh, for that, for that application or the website, whatever, for, for that product, let's say? So, whenever, so we need to, if, if you look into it, there are Nginx logs, there are MySQL logs, they are buried inside somewhere. They have at least some of the information that I asked, but we, had, we, we, we never went in and tried to find out what, what was it telling. All of a sudden, it went down, or you see a white screen. What do you do? You generally go and dig into logs, right? Rather than that, why not have a web interface that would, almost in real time, or in a matter of two minutes, would give you everything. I would, I would later show you some screenshots of gray log. So these things would try to Turn off all the logs and then give you out the the information that you need. One, two. You could do your own logging. By that I mean you you will have a a logger object and you could say info blah blah. Let's say, for example, sending SMSs. As soon as I route it to the gateway, I think it gives him back something, right? That that you could process or not, right? Wrong. So let's assume it's, it's right. As soon as I give something to the SS gateway, it gives me back a response saying, I could do it or I could do it. 
So we could log each one of that and then look it up into gray log to, to see, okay, the SMS are working fine. Else, we just hope we don't have any tests to, 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 to do that. Generally, we will not have tests for third party services. That, that's also one other thing. And then we, we, we deployed live. Unless we, we really do something and then get the SMS on our handsets, we don't know that the code is working, right? And let's say if you are working in a multi-country environment where you are serving seven countries, so you don't have the numbers of the, the, all, all the seven countries, right? So if, if, if I'm in, in the UAE and the SMS is not going to Saudi Arabia, I don't know. But if I have logs that say, okay, this was fine, this was fine, this was fine, then I know. So logging and monitoring, we really need it. The other thing is New Relic. So New Relic gives a lot of data about the errors, uh, even the performances, like response times and everything. I think just, just this morning, someone was telling that the site was slow, right? But unless of, uh, let's say, Google Site Speed or something like that, we don't have anything on our own that says, okay, what, what, what was really slow? Was it the database? Okay, we, we assume that it, these are the images. So we might come up with a solution saying, okay, let's put them all in, in, a, in a CDN, and the probability the site will be fast. But then we find, find out after getting a CDN and uploading them, that the, the real problem was a database. If you add three indexes to the database, it's 30% faster, right? So we don't have any anything that says these, these stuff right now. We could add them. Yeah, the other thing, we need to document stuff. I think this also has been a long running saga. But I, I don't know how much stuff has been documented. Let's say not for all the projects, not for the, the small ones, but at least something that runs two, two years. Right? If someone is joining now, you could read the document for two days and learn a lot than talking with everyone. Code reviews. Uh, I think I explained this earlier as well. If you want to hear a story, we have code reviews that go for days. So there, there goes like, there are wars between the guy who opened the code review, uh, the, the guy who opened the pull request, and the guy who is commenting, right? About coding standards, about variable naming, about this, about that. I and mean, code review is, is a very good way to learn to code. And I think if, if we can adopt that, everyone will grow. Pair programming. How much have you heard about about pair programming? How much of you have really practiced it here? Very less. Yeah, but that that's like let's let's sit together and let's let's do something. That's not really fair programming, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what I what I'm saying is maybe five years back, if I knew knew about fair programming, I would have really loved to have some fair programming sessions with I'm just like probably. So just have him here. I write code, he checks. He writes code, I check. We switch roles every half an hour. Pretty easy. When there are four eyes looking at the code, then two. It's it's a lot easier to get things done. One and then we have multiple points of view coming coming for that whole that that solution. Probably the, the, the solution I'm thinking of, he has a better solution than that. <coughs> so pair programming is a very good way to learn to code better. Yeah, and then documenting important things. So first two major things are done. The third thing we really need to beef up, speed up is automate. What do you mean by that? So I was asking about Docker. How many of we use uh, any virtualized environment? Because just in the morning, uh, Shweta was saying her PHP is not running uh, on, on her Mac. How many of you face this problem? Right? Uh, how, how many of you face problems like Okay, Andan has version 5.4 of PHP, I have version 5.5, it works on his system and does work in mine. Right? Stuff like that. So, why not adopt something like Docker or, or even Vagrant? Docker is like a very popular buzzword these days. Well, the basic idea is application should be self-sufficient. What do I mean by that? I mean, with code, you would have some files that could also create the environment for you. Let's say if you are building a PHP application which requires MySQL, even Redis, and RabbitMQ. So there would be a Docker file 
or even multiple Docker files and a way to link those containers. So each container, there will be one container running PHP and FPM, one container running RabbitMQ, one container running Redis, and you would link them up together. And the application is self-sufficient. You can run it in the same folder. Everything is there. Without having the need to install PHP on your local system, Redis on your local system, or anything. So that's the basic concept of Docker. Containerize. Vagrant, on the other hand, is just uh, just an orchestration layer on, on a virtual machine. For example, like if you are using a Windows machine and someone else is, is, is using a, a Linux machine, you just want things to be on the same page, you get a Linux virtual machine, he also has a Linux virtual machine, and both of you use the same virtual machine, where things are same, like version of software, the software, and, and things like that. Currently, we are using Vagrant, but we are really looking into switching to Docker. This is something I think the, the sysadmin should look more into, so that we can go into the real code rather than trying to set up. Let's say if, if, a, new, if a new joinee comes in and spends two days just to set up the machine, that's a problem. Rather than that, he has a, a Vagrant for now, let's say. He just runs, downloads the stuff, or copies it, because here, you don't want to be take time, so copies the box and says Vagrant up, Maximum five minutes, everything is there for it. I think that we lack. Okay, um, how much, in in what interval do you think Amazon deploys? Every day? Every week? Amazon, You all of you know Amazon, right? So, to ship new things, let's say there is a new button that, that comes at the top right. Someone has to code it, and that has to be deployed live, so that the button comes up there. So to do this, someone has to deploy it, right? So in what interval do you think Amazon deploys? Every day, I, I don't know, every day at 12 there, so that people, people don't get a 404 or, or a 500 something? Finish every shift, every shift, after finishing every shift. So what, what, what does that mean? Every minute, or just just give me a, just give me a random guess. Every minute, every five minutes, every every day at twelve, every every Friday at uh, two two a.m. Mm -hmm. So when you are uh, Amazon developer finish some feature or some bug fixes, mm -hmm. automatically they de deploy the system automatically. So you're talking about continuous delivery. Uh, could be. But I need a, a a number like a like a time frame. Seventeen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Seventeen minutes is, is like a very very long time. So Amazon de can deploy every eleven seconds. So every eleven seconds they have a new feature or a new bug fix coming up on their website. Now think about us and think about uh, HTM that's running for two two years. Can we deploy every 11 seconds? In 11 seconds, you, you wouldn't be able to assess into the machine and do a git pull. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem is, we rely on proper manual deployments. And till now, I think we have generally just one server applications. So maybe that's why we haven't felt the need of having any automatic, automatic deployment software. Because it's just one server. You can go there, git pull, uh, I don't know, run a command to run the database migration, everything's fine. Imagine if you had 10. Would you be able to do that on 10 servers in 11 seconds? <laughs> you can't even do it in one. So that's why we need an automated deployment strategy and an automated deployment tool. Capstone is something that we are using and it's, it's quite powerful. We, we are now even able to deploy <coughs> like 10 servers in live in like a minute or so with, with zero downtime deployment. What do I mean by zero downtime deployment? That means, let's say someone is, someone has something in their in their cart. I'll I'll talk more about e-commerce e because that's 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 what I'm working on right now. And let's say if if we were deploying one month back and that guy was checking out, and the deployment and the checkout were at the same second, okay, then that guy would see a 502 because the server, the the engineer server restarted. That's a problem. Zero down on deployment means now the server doesn't restart; it just reloads, and then the guy can check out when we are deploying. So even if it collides on the same second, no problems. He's he's already still placed. 
So zero dawn deployment, maybe we don't need it right now, but think of, we get, a, we get an amazing project, amazingly scalable app that needs to be deployed in five servers, and they tell us to have zero dawn time deployment. Are we ready for that? I mean, I'm not saying it's not impossible. Probably we might get a project that, that's like really scalable. They have five servers, and they would eventually want down zero dawn time deployment. And generally, any, any type of automation. Right? When I push to GitLab, it sends me a notification trigger in the chat. Uh, a, week, a week or 10 days back, someone was asking, uh, Andres, uh, sorry, Anandai, did you push that uh, somewhere on, on, on one of the chats? Why do that? Why not have every, every comment being there? When you push to GitLab, it, it automatically pushes to a Bitbucket and runs the build. By this, I mean, a CI server that's all, all, always checking if someone pushed a new branch or someone merged something to master or someone even pushed a new tag so that it can run the tests. For now, we don't have tests. That's why we need to start writing tests. Remind me of it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story of, of us writing tests. Yeah, and then Hitchat is notified about, notified about all the deployment start and its progress. Till now we don't have automated deployments, but if we use Amstrano, we can even have that. So no one needs to ask what happened. Is is what what happened to the to the deployment is going or not going on or not? What's the stage and everything? Not only that, one thing that we practice and I think that is a very easy addition that could be done here is having a version.txt file on on the project base. So let's say if I have HTM, I I have HTM.org slash so version.txt, it will tell me the tag, the last deployment, when, when did it happen, which, which commit hash, and even who, who deployed it. We can have all this if we have automated deployment. So these are like all the proposals and suggestions I have. Basically, these are all proposals and suggestions. They have to be approved from the back, and then, and then we could come. But what I want, what I want is, it shouldn't be like a top-down approach where someone would say do it and everyone would try to do it or try to start to do it. Why not make it a bottom-up approach? Why not you guys explore these things? This, this, this as I said, just a pointer. So why, why not you guys look into this even more and then go to Anjizda and say, Anjizda, Capistrano is fine, but I think I found a better a better deployment tool that's that's even faster. Or Anjizda, I tried to compare Vagrant and Docker and then found Docker to be better. So I think that, that, that's the step that we want that would be better. So let's fast forward to somewhere around 2015 first quarter. Then we have things like automated code quality checks in, in place. And what, what I mean by that is someone is coding and someone wants to comment. And because he has some problems with the syntax or some spacing, and then the, the PSR2 code checker is telling him, man, first fix your code, and then only you can come. <laughs> so we could even do, do stuff like this. This is already there. If you just check those two links, you can even implement it as of now. So things, things like these can even be part of the procedure. That's a pre-commit hook. So if, whenever you try to comment, before it commits, it checks stuff. If, if the space between your if closing and the curly bracket, there is not one space, it will stop you and say, fix that. Or as, as, as there is a fixer right now, so you could even run one command and then it will fix it automatically. So the guy who reviews your code never has to worry about coding standards at least. 2015 Q1, we have fair programming. <laughs> I, I didn't find any, any other picture of the guys <laughs> together, so yeah. Let's <laughs> let's go on with this. But the but the main idea is having four eyes, having four eyes to solve one one issue, one problem, and then trying to get the best out of it. And generally, pair programming is done between a, a junior and a senior, so that junior learns more from the senior. It's just general practice. Then we have code reviews, <coughs> and in code reviews we have stuff like this. So looking at the code, someone would say, good job, you, 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 this was a very good solution. And then someone would say, why is there an empty function in your, in your uh, commit? Why is this class empty? Why doesn't it have an interface? Why doesn't it extend this class? 
Why are you throwing your custom exception? Because there is already a 404 not found exception. Why are you doing this? So now probably everyone pushes to master. Code works, no problem, it works. But we never know about these things going to master. So maybe someone wrote like four blank functions, they are there since one year, and we don't know about it. And that code is executed. That's, that's taking time, that's taking memory, that's taking everything. But no one knows, as we all, all, always come to master. This is the tool for ASCII. And I ran some tests for HTML as it was, as it was open. I'll just show you the test results later because it had loads and loads of issues, but generally on the CSS part. And then the the Quarasi service, it gives like everything. How many issues you have, what's the problem, and things like that. So generally the code style part, we can already eliminate it with the CS fixer. As soon as you have that, you would never put something that's not compliant with the coding standards, PSR. So we could have this, and again, this is free. So why not? And we let's say we have an automated build service for at least all our major projects, which have unit tests. So when I push a branch, my test would run, and then I would get that green stuff. If if test fail, I would get it red. So then I cannot deploy it. It's, it's a very it's a very clear thing that unless your test passed. Okay, for, for the story for us. Someone reviews the code only if the test passes. Finish. So first the CI thing runs all your tests. If it passes, then only someone will use the code. Else, I mean code review, because it cannot go, go live, so there is no point in trying to review the code. Mm, this is Shippable's um, screenshot. It even has things like, I could run the same test on PHP 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, and all this stuff. And in three, four months time, let's say we also have a pre-lock set up somewhere, maybe a service or locally, and then we know all the issues like, okay, we had like 500, uh, 404 in the last 20 minutes, so there's a problem. We had 400, 503s, so there's a problem in the server. Maybe the user disk space is, is low, so we can check those things. Oh, snap. And yeah, we also have, we would also like to have a relic which would give us all the monitoring details, all the performance details, all the response times and stuff like that. To recap, we need process to improve developer productivity. Probably everyone agrees with this. If not, you can raise your hand and ask me why. And yeah, it will take time to, it will take some time to follow <coughs> these new processes so that it becomes a habit. And as I said, it would be a lot better that it comes from, it comes bottom up. You guys look at things and then go up to understand and say, we want this in place. Yeah, and the things I told you are really <coughs> very good practices, take it from me because, yeah, I think this is a good place to tell the story. Uh, one year and seven, eight months back, we didn't have tests. So we just, we just hoped everything was fine. And, and that is a very big problem for an e-commerce venture. Because you cannot just rely on hope. One year, six, seven, eight months back, we then started to write tests. Probably the problem we had there was we, we started writing kind of functional tests, but that thing really helped. It, it really boosts your, your confidence about the code. When you see that green, green light coming up when all the test passes, you, you, you are quite sure that, okay, my code is gonna work. And Things like that, it's test from test, then you have continuous integration. Probably you can even have automated deployments and stuff. So let's say if you fully follow continuous delivery and things are automated, someone pushes the code, someone, then the test passed. Someone just checks, like gives it a quick look, does the review, everything's fine. As soon as you merge to master, there is a script that automatically deploys your code. So master is like the main branch, which is always deployable, always stable. So as soon as someone merges it, it could be automatically deployed. That would save a lot of time to everyone. Let's see if we go into continuous delivery. 
And yes, it's not about the tools and technologies. It's about how we use them. Git is used by Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, name any big company. So probably how we use Git and how they use Git has a very vast difference. So I think you should also think about changing and learning. If I don't learn a new Git command every three months, probably there's a problem. I need to fix it. How many of you use uh, Git Bisect? How many of you have heard about it? Why why use Git Bisect? Uh, we suppose we you got the code drive the way and you get bisect it and uh, we can you know your code commit you commit it, good code is bad code is here and tell you move it. So you can pinpoint where the problem started. Nice. So these are things. We, we have been using Git from the past, I don't know, seven, six, seven years. But how many new commands did you learn in the last six months? Probably we always do the git diff, add, commit, push, pull, finish. Git has a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. So by, by that I mean <coughs> the tools that we use, we should try to leverage more. Very clear. I think the whole, the whole story is all about this. We really need to improve technically at YPL. Not only for us, but uh, also for the people that want to join YPL. Because let's say if we could write blogs about Docker tomorrow. Let's say if we have a very robust uh, automated deployment system. I mean, I think it would really attract attract a lot of good talent. We would not need to like really search for them. They will automatically come to us. So how do you want to see the CEO? Probably currently he is something like this. <laughs> in all the chaos, in all the chaos, standing here, 20 people talking. <laughs> By the time it's his turn, it's half an hour, he has forgotten how to say. So rather than this, rather than putting him into chaos, I think we should go for order. <laughs> and, and, then, and then we should we should try to see that he is happy. He, he has the stock of all the all the projects where they are in just one glance. As I said, we are already into 2015 quarter, first quarter, and we have things in place. People are writing tests. People are doing program, uh, sorry, pair, pair programming. We have automated deployment stuff. We have some virtualized environment. A new, a new joiny, a new trainee comes, or a new software engineer comes. 15 minutes flat, he is able to start writing code, and not having to install PHP, MySQL, uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, and everything on the system. I mean, I think that made him something like this. But eventually, it's not about him. It's about each one of you. And the growth of each one of you. So that it would synergize to become the growth of YPO. I mean, if everyone improves, automatically YPO will improve. If these projects are taken, I mean, if, if they are put in place properly and practiced and implemented properly, all of you can even be sellable probably at uh, the Silicon Valley or any, any place in Europe. Because these are the general procedures that all the big companies follow. Any questions? <laughs> Please, go ahead. Simple Git flow mm -hmm. okay. so what is the Main difference? Simple Git flow basically says only one ticket goes live at a time. One deployment, number of deployments increase unless uh, automated deployment.